Hello students, today is a very special Sociology 235 lecture video because I am recording it from the place that I grew up. Um, literally the first time in my life I have taught from uh, this place, from this apartment, but yet here we are. Um, today uh, and tomorrow really, I, I want to talk about like really large and high level things within the global system. Sorry, this chair is that, this is not my office chair and I feel like it's, it's uncomfortable for me. Um, I, I wanna talk about high level stuff within the world system, pardon me, let me go backwards. And uh, that starts with a uh, discussion of myths of development. I want to go through uh, seven, I think seven, um, what I consider to be myths of development um, and, and demonstrate why these are uh, myths of development, to try to understand what the challenge of the next 30 years is, is very likely to be. And then uh, probably tomorrow, uh, that video is going to deal with uh, something called the political trilemma, um, which will be the structure, kind of the orienting structure that um, overlooks the decisions that we will make regarding development, both within nations, um, between nations, and, and within global institutions going forward. This picture is one that you've likely seen before. It won the Pulitzer in, uh, I want to say 1994 or 1995, um, one of those years. And, and this is a famous picture during a famine in um, Ethiopia. Um, during that particular uh, point in time. It's a very stunning picture, right? This this um, child has collapsed from hunger and exhaustion, and you have a vulture um, behind that child just waiting, right? Waiting. Um, I use this picture, A, because it's famous, and you've probably seen it before, but also because um, that child did end up surviving. Um, I guess I, I have no idea where that child is today as an adult, but but did survive that you know moment in period. Um, and that's the segue into what I want to start talking about today. A lot of the world's most pressing problems are linked to the interrelated concepts of poverty, inequality, both between countries and within countries, and stunted development. The fact that some countries have advanced their living standards far faster and far more dramatically than other parts of the world. And so there has been a real stretching of the standard deviation when it comes to living standards uh, within countries. So in 2018, 3.5 million children died of hunger, according to the UN and the World Food Program. Now, that is horrible, and that is heartbreaking, and yet that is the lowest that number has ever been, and to give, like, ever since records started getting kept on it. Now, to give you perhaps even some more um, insight onto that statistic, in 2014, six and a half million children died of hunger. So that number, even in just a short six-year period, or four-year period, pardon me, um, that number was cut in half. What this shows you is that development is possible and improving the living standards of the most vulnerable people on earth is possible to the level of millions of children surviving that otherwise would not have. So that's the lowest that number has ever been. What I want to do with my time here today is to go through seven what I think of as enduring myths of development. These are things that that are largely, they're myths because they're not proven out, they're just not supported by data. And yet at the same time, I hear this very frequently within the international aid literature or on CNN, um, things like that. So the first myth, right, really, and what I think is sort of the most, the most important myth um, is that of permanent poverty. So permanence, is, is it true that some places will just always be poor? Um, I, to, to, to argue that, I think, is a real myopic thing. I think it's very myopic to pretend that countries that are rich today did not themselves have a poor phase at, at some point um, in their history. So it's not true that just some places will always be poor. And you don't just have to look at like the United States 200 years ago um, you know, to, to make that um, case or to look at Poland even 75 years ago. Look at just what has happened in Africa over the last decade. From 2010 through 2020, seven of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world 
are in Africa. So the poorest part of the world is also the place where we're seeing the fast growth. And should that continue, if that can be done in an equitable and sustainable way, we're going to have a lot more of Africa look like Botswana and Ghana, which are two real African success stories. Um, and a lot less of Africa looking like Zimbabwe, for example, or, or the Central African Republic. So Africa, you always have to be careful when discussing Africa as if it's this monolithic thing. You have over 50 countries in the continent of Africa, um, many of which have their own unique economic, post-colonial and um, political situations that they have to contend with. But more and more of Africa is overcoming some of its most serious challenges. It is a mistake, right? It is not true that Africa will always be this mess of AIDS and civil war and child, childhood hunger. No, 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 no. That, that thinking that way is, again, as I said, a real myopic way of interpreting where the world is going. And so if you look at this at this uh, map here, the top fastest growing economies in 2018, I see Ghana, Ethiopia, the Ivory Coast, Djibouti, um, Senegal, and Tanzania. It's many African countries embedded uh, in this list. And so I don't like this idea that Africa is always going to be poor, maybe in a relative sense, and maybe over a long period of time. But I just don't know where this idea came from. When you look at the economic growth numbers, I, I see a lot of countries poised to really burst onto the scene in the world system. And what's amusing about this is the countries that are doing so are doing so either without resources or um, with very modest amounts of resources. I've said this before, and it's worth saying again now in the last week of this class, um, Africa is not a naturally poor place. It's one of the most resource rich places in the world. And every single year, $400 billion of wealth leaves the African continent. Oil and natural gas, minerals, lumber, diamonds, consumer goods. The problem is not the resources themselves, but without very structuralized institutions that can distribute benefits to people living in those countries, you're never going to see resources really make the difference. So in the case, and, and you can just compare like one kind of success story to not a success story. Um, because of all the resources in the Congo, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, that's become a failed state, right? A, a center of, 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 of um, on again, off again, civil war and, 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 and ethnic insurgencies. So there, resources simply have not been used to enrich the, the, uh, the Congolese people. Now, in the case of Saudi Arabia, as we learned last week, the Saudis did use that money uh, to enrich their uh, their people, and it's created also a very like one of the most deeply non democratic states in the world. Resources actually don't matter as much as we think they do. They mattered a great deal in a historical sense, and they have often motivated conflict and expansion and empire. But we're past that now. We're past that in in a way um, that we're probably not going back to. Um, so the challenge is not to just like, oh, can we, do we have resources? Can we make use of them? No, the challenge for all these countries is to make sure that these resources can actually be used to the benefit of average Africans, um, which is simply not happening in enough places. Um, and so Africa there becomes simply the most um, severe case study of um, a, a challenge that the entire world faces. So remember ye resource curse. Um, that's a solid idea that is probably not going away anytime soon. Now, the third myth I often hear very frequently is that, all right, we have this gap between really rich countries and really poor countries. We have this really serious gap uh, in living standards. And um, how many of you have ever been hit up for money by a relative, right? You go to Thanksgiving and your uncle's hitting you up for hitting you up for a little money. Um, or maybe that's just my Thanksgiving. I don't know. Um, one of the big uh, things I hear is, all right, well, on the one hand, charity, right? Global charity and global foreign aid that is something that can be used 
to the benefit of developing and poor countries. There's two things I want to say about this. One is many argue that aid is ultimately pointless because low income countries are too corrupt. And so if you look at this um, map here, uh, in some ways, this is a legitimate argument. In some ways, let me be clear what, what I'm saying here. It is absolutely a truthful statement to say that um, many low income countries have very corrupt public sectors, right? And so you can see the color of a place like uh, Brazil in this map, to Russia, to Ukraine and Belarus. You go across all parts of the world and you can find countries with deeply corrupt public sectors. And so the argument is, well, you can give aid to Cambodia, but it's just going to be wasted through um, corruption and kickbacks and government bribes and whatever. Um, there, is a, there is definitely an element of truth to this, but it gets the causality wrong. Poor countries are not poor because they are corrupt. They are corrupt because they are poor. And it seems likely to me that there is a form of foreign aid that can make those countries less poor and therefore less, res or, uh, less vulnerable to corruption, right? To the, the forces of, of, of um, local and national level corruption. Another thing to keep in mind about foreign aid is that foreign aid, uh, well, there's a lot to... There's a lot to keep in mind about foreign aid. Um, something to keep in mind that when foreign aid has a real impact, it usually occurs in one of three areas. Foreign aid that encourages gender-based equity has real outsized impact. Foreign aid that encourages climate adaptation generally has outsized impact. Foreign aid that puts money in the pockets of local institutions perhaps doesn't. And so that is kind of the big issue that, that's going on with, with, with foreign aid. So really, and that's the segue I want going into, into the next thing that I want to talk about. Hey, if foreign aid worked. I mean, Africa's been getting it for a century now, or not a century, I 50 years, let's say. Africa's been getting this shit forever. Like, wouldn't Africa be rich by now? Okay, a lot to say about that one. Um, again, I, I harbor no illusions that Africa is like in a great position globally. But keep in mind, colonialism lasted approximately three times as long as the current era of African state independence and, um, and foreign aid receipts. So those countries, right, you look at South Sudan and say, yeah, it's the most corrupt uh, country in the world. It's the most failed state in the world. You know what else that country is? Nine years old, right? Like it's a, it's a nine year old country. Um, and it's ridiculous to hold it to even the standards of Nigeria, which is what, 50 years old at this point. Um, and so in 2018, the world globally spent $30 per sub-Saharan Africa. For starters, that's not a lot of money, right? 30 bucks is not a big deal. But let's just, you know, that, that, that that's the number. Let's stick with that for a second. And let's break that down. $5 of that, of that 30 bucks, $5 goes to consultants, $3 for emergency aid, which is cool. But, you know, it's, it's, it's also not like a sustainable thing necessarily. $4 to foreign debt. There's the IMF getting their cut. $5 to debt administration costs. There's the World Bank getting their cut. And $12 to Africans. If I gave you $12 tomorrow, is that really going to make a big difference in your life? No, go buy a six pack and have fun with it, but that's not gonna make a big uh, difference in your life. 12 bucks is not denting the problem, like at all. Um, and so keep that in mind about foreign aid is, is that A, a lot less of it is getting to normal people than is sometimes thought, uh, than is sometimes believed. And also foreign aid doesn't take up as much of budgets as we often think it does. And the type of foreign aid that dominates our aid budget is all going to one specific thing, which is not really what we're talking about when we mention development. So what I want you to do is just think in your head, maybe write down in your notes, just write down a, write down a guess. I want you to estimate what percentage of um, Amer America's uh, national budget do you think goes to foreign aid? The answer is um, less than a percent, right? less than a percent here. Um, while the United States gives a lot of money, 
Um, right, $19 billion as of 2004. I guess I probably should have looked for more recent numbers here, but but it's only, it's a fraction of a percent, um, a percentage of GDP. Oh, I said budget, sorry. I meant uh, percentage of GDP. My bad, guys. Yeah, yeah, the biggest aid donor in the world is actually Norway, right? Norway is the only one that's that's approaching even 1% of their GDP on development assistance. So the United States um, isn't really giving as much. The, the, the aid budget of all these countries is actually quite minimal. And the top aid recipients of the United States budget here in 2018 were the following five countries. Israel, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, Egypt. Can you think of something that those five countries have in common? If you said they were all really important military allies, you're right. It's all military aid and that's it, right? Like, well, I shouldn't say that's it, but that's a big part of it. Um, and that is the majority of it. So keep that in mind the next time you hear about the aid budget. Um, realize it's not that much money and realize that a lot of military um, dollars are getting lumped in with development assistance, right? So if money is given and it leads to the elimination of a waterborne um, parasite disease in Central Africa, to me, that's a far different like way of spending money than letting Israel buy fighter jets, for example, or letting the having the Pakistanis upgrade their you know uh, missile defense systems. Um, which look, I mean, if that's how the State Department wants to spend that money, you know, fair enough. But understand that that's not really development aid at all, and and a lot of too many times that gets lumped in with the with 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 development aid in a way that I think is a little bit dishonest. Okay, so myth five, out of impossibility. This is kind of getting to that first, like the, the, the permanence issue, right? Will Africa always be poor? Or like, what about African resources? You know, this is getting to that, you know, sort of issue that we discussed um, in, the, in the first myth. Um, somebody, the problem is just too vast and it's too big and there's absolutely no way that any one individual um, or country or any one individual, certainly any one country can solve it on their own. Um, and I would say, yeah, I, there is no one individual that can solve these problems on their own. But if you break problems, like the world pro world's problems down into individual problems, those actually can be solved. Um, what we, we do not lack for resources. What we lack is a political will to distribute those resources in a way that might violate the spirit of capitalism. But fundamentally, like what I want to do is not destroy capitalism at all. What I want to do is hold it to a much higher standard than it is currently held to in the current day. So to demonstrate this point of like the, 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 these things are uh, fixing these problems is actually far from impossible and encouraging development is, is far from impossible. You would need $3.2 billion to end childhood hunger annually. So that's a year over year cost. Every year you'd have to come up with 3.2 billion to end childhood hunger. It's a lot of money. How about you guys out there? You got $3.2 billion? Um, I don't. So yeah, alone, us, we cannot fix uh, world uh, childhood hunger and, and, and global childhood hunger. Keep in mind though, that that bank bailout back in 2008, the last time there was a massive bank bailout, um, that cost the country $700 billion. That's enough times to end, that's enough money to end childhood hunger for a lot of years in a row. So it's out there. The resources is there. And what we lack is a will to spend money in that way. Two billion people are chronically malnourished. And, then, and of those two billion, right? 3.5 uh, million of those uh, of those are children who starve to death every year. Compare that to the fact that globally 1.9 billion people are obese and they all live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Oh, in your face, Wisconsin. Um, no, it, it really, I'm making a joke here, but I probably shouldn't. Um, 
No, I, two billion uh, children, two billion people are malnourished, and almost the same amount are obese. So what we have is a distribution problem. There is, there's actually enough food on planet Earth to feed everybody their calorie allotment every day, one point five times over. So you're actually generating a surplus. That's how good the green revolution has been for us. But it has been folded into a capitalist distribution system that leads to a lot of waste. And that leads to a situation where there's not a lot of money to be made in providing services of any kind to the poor. Um, and so that's how the poor end up in, oh, like, not just chronically st chronic states of malnourishment, but chronic states of disadvantage and inequality. Okay. Mid six, I'm going to race through this because I got somewhere to be, but, um, uh, but, but also because I think this one's pretty easy to understand. We talked about this with population. There's a belief I sometimes hear that we already have a population problem, which I don't think we do, but, but let's just pretend that we do for a second. Poverty relief might stress an already overpopulated world. First of all, I just told you there's 1.5 calories for every one calorie somebody needs on, on planet Earth every day. But no, develop, uh, encouraging development throughout the world would actually lead to a stable, a much like a stabilization of fertility rates. Fertility is always lower in developing countries, One, or, or in developed, pardon me. As countries develop, children go from being an economic asset to being an economic cost, and you will just have fewer of them. And the more women are folded into the workforce, which is a really big part of encouraging national development, the fewer children um, women of that country will generally have. Development is actually, it's not going to cause overpopulation. It likely, might, it likely would be the solution to it. If you can fold that in with a climate policy, that right there would solve sort of two of the biggest sources of misery um, throughout the world. And then myth seven, this is going to lead directly into what I talk about tomorrow. Myth seven is that of the market, the mythical market. Now, look, I, I don't, I'm not disputing that markets exist, but also markets are social constructions and markets risk becoming prisons if you think that they're self-regulating or self-creating. No, markets can work efficiently when they harness people's self-interest, but they need to be regulated in order to produce the type of social outcomes that we want. If all you care about is a blood, like a bloodthirsty type of efficiency, then yeah, turn everything over to the market and, and embrace neoliberal doc, doc, doctrine. But I think we've done that to a large extent in the last 30 years. And a lot of people don't really like where we ended up. So this idea that neoliberal doctrine is going to produce the richest world possible, I just want to point out two things. How do you explain the fact that India, China, South Korea, and Brazil, who are the, like the four, probably the four biggest success stories of globalization, those are the countries that sort of adopted neoliberal ideas the most selectively. Those are countries that nurtured and protected their own domestic industries before they deregulated and opened them up, them up to foreign competition. Um, they only embrace this selectively. I think it's a real problem for neoliberal doctrine that the countries that seem to have benefited the most from it are the ones that embraced it the most cautiously and the most selectively. So there's a third way style of economics out there that is waiting to be produced and put together um, within the system. So what really works? Like what really does ultimately work? Health, education, and climate, especially when those things include a preferential option for girls and women within countries where the level of gender um, equity is, is very low. Right? Raising that up, it's, it's a tremendously helpful thing um, for countries to address these things, right? The health but also the health of women where that's a problem. Education, especially of women when it's a problem in climate, right? Because women uh, also in, in, in rural countries, women are, are going to be hit very hard by that um, as well as, as agricultural livelihoods are, are ultimately lost. Um, and they will then enter a country that, you know, doesn't have a lot of places for, for them to, you know, ultimately contribute. Um, and then finally, like across almost, across most countries throughout the world, like from 1985 to 2008, or right, kind of the peak globalization era, income inequality Inequality has increased in almost every country throughout the world, right? We have baked inequality into our system. And what this has done is created something that I'll talk to you about during our last lecture in our last video. It's called the globalization paradox.
Ooh, what's a paradox? Um, we'll talk about that um, in the video I'll have for you tomorrow. Um, thank you for bearing with me, you guys. I appreciate it. And um, take care of yourselves. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye.